Uh, but I'm also reminded of the scripture that says in season and out. And I do believe that's, you know, when it feels good, when it doesn't, when it seems to fit, when it doesn't, preach the word of God because at the end of the day, and we'll see that in our lesson today, it's the word of God that we need. It is the answer for everything we go through. And as you will see, there is in great encouragement here at the end of this. So let's, let's step back a little bit. Let's go back and let's hit reverse for a moment. And open up your Bibles to the book of Jude, a very short book. There's only uh, 25 verses in Jude, but there's so much said. We're, we're spending our third week on this. You remember that this is Jude, the brother of Jesus speaking. And Jude tells you right up front. You know, I've always had this in my mind that I want to write this, this, this great book about our salvation and what we enjoy. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit said, nope, you're going to write a short little book. That's all you get to do. And it's going to have a pretty impactful and hard tone to it. But Jude, willing, realized God's church needs to hear some really straightforward stuff and he, he, by theme starts in verse three, and he says that you and I are to contend, to, to agonize, to struggle for the faith, which was once and for all entrusted to us. And so we begin to look at some of the things and it's very easy to figure out as soon as you start into this book that Jude realizes, wow, the church is under attack. Satan will never destroy the church from without. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. But if there's a place where Satan can make an inroad, it will be from within the church. And so Jude begins to describe that to us. And our illustration was when, you know, if somebody's going to break into your house, you'd like to know certain things because you can prepare yourself. And I believe that's what Jude is doing. He's saying, let me tell you about these people. And so over and over and over again, he uses this phrase, these men. And then he describes them. And we've looked at all five or six of those. There's certainly an urgency about what he is saying. One of the first things that we looked at is that there is sort of a secret nature to what these people do. Um, and we'll, we'll see that again in some different things that we look at today. He talks about these people are people that exchange the grace of God and try to make it into a license for sin. Grace covers everything. So let's don't worry about sin. Let's just talk more about grace. And Jude saw that as a very dangerous, and we have attached a word for that. They're called libertines. And then he begins to describe them further, and he says they reject authority. They struggle with authority. They resist authority in their life. He says that chaos follows them. Uh, he describes them as people who murmur and people who complain. And Jude says, boy, that's just, it's dangerous. Okay. And we're going to pick up right there in verse 16. And we're going to look at the second part of that and finish up our study on Jude. Stay with me. There's some good news coming. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Now, there's three sermons right there waiting to happen. We don't have time to do that. I will say this about how they follow their own desires. Whenever we approach Scripture... Trying to, trying to find what we want, we're in trouble. Let me say that again. 
Because this is said in 2 Timothy 4, it's said so many places in the Bible, they'll follow their own desires. It's a dangerous thing as we're trying to defend the gospel once and for all delivered into the saints. It's been entrusted to us. It is a highly dangerous thing for you and I to pick up the Bible and pick it up going there to find what I want to find. Do you follow me? It's too easy. And it's dangerous to do that. And that's one of the ways that Jude marks these people. Don't ever pick up the Bible and go, you know, it really sounds good to me. And I wish it would say, because you can twist and contort and turn and kind of reason over. And, uh, you know, I, I was sharing in the first service this morning. You know what I think that ultimately says? Hey, God, you did a rotten job having the Bible written. You couldn't just say it like you mean it and say it in plain English, Greek or Aramaic or whatever. Yeah, I did. Just listen to it. So let's all be careful as we open and we try to defend what God has given us. That's one of the things. But I want to key in on the last thing he says in that little grouping of three. By the way, we'll come back to that in a moment. He says they flatter people for their own advantage. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever, has it ever dawned on you or realized, we use the phrase, they're buttering me up. You see, I think what he's trying to teach us is this. If all these men did was grumble and complain, sooner or later, you'd figure that out, right? You'd go, okay, here they come again. What are they gonna grumble, murmur, and complain about now? Sooner or later, you would figure that out, right? And so the sneaky part of this is, if you use flattery in this process, you can keep people kind of in your court or keep people following the thinking you're trying to draw them down. And you've probably experienced, oh, you know, oh, bro, bro, you are the best preacher I've ever heard in my life. I don't want to listen to anybody else but you. And then five minutes later in the conversation, here it comes. Hey, bro, what do you think about what I think about? And you know, uh, it's just sheer manipulation. Be careful with people who flatter you. Oh, bro, bro, you, bro, I'll tell you what. If you were in charge of this church... Things be different. You, you, you got it. You, you're on it, bro. That's dangerous stuff. That's exactly how these people work. Be driven by the word of God, not the flattery of men. Then he goes to the last one we're going to look at, at least in terms of the sort of negative things. Verse 19. These are men who divide you. Another characteristic of these people is division. Not only does chaos follow them, but division is the result. And I happen to believe this is a summary statement. It's sort of the culmination of all of those other things. They murmur, they complain, they reject authority, chaos is all around, they have a libertine thinking, and the end result is... They end up dividing you. And you know what the Bible says about division. Think about what Jude must have been thinking. Thinking about the prayer that his brother prayed right before he left this earth. Lord, I pray that they'd be one as well. I pray you keep them together. I, I, that's where Satan, and Jesus knew it's where he's going to attack. Here's Jude, the brother of Jesus. And he goes, you know what ultimately happens here? These people, they divide you. Now he says one other thing about these people. And I want to get you to think about this for a moment in light of what he's going to say in just a moment. Well, let me just do, let me switch gears and I'll come back to that. All right, so we got this list of six, seven, there's probably even eight things in only 20 some odd verses already. So like I said, day one, get ready. It's 
Whew, it's a lot to swallow in such a short number of verses that Jude is writing this woo in your face kind of book to go church you need to wake up you need to realize this I would have loved to written about this but I can't all right so now hopefully you kind of got that and you go wow yeah this guy was serious but he doesn't stop there and this is the part we now need to take in and go okay then whoo I mean what are we going to do check IDs at the door and see if Libertine is on their driver's license or something. I mean, it's not like they're going to announce themselves. And so it can kind of leave you feeling, wow, that's heavy. And and I'm supposed to defend this? Um, I will tell you that reading this book gives me more pause as a minister than just about anything I read in the Bible. And I think if you talk to some of our elders and our other ministers, they would say the same because one of the tasks given to us is to make sure this doesn't happen. Remember we read the scripture last week out of Hebrews 13, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They, they watch over you as men who must give account. I will tell you, I can lay awake thinking about this right here and go, it's our collective job as a leadership team to protect this church and to make sure we stay unified and to make sure we don't fall for these things that we've been studying for three weeks. And and, and we don't do this lightly and it is not sometimes without a very heavy heart. And so these next words are very encouraging. And I hope they will encourage you too to focus ourselves. Now, the first one he says, it's found in verse 20. Anytime you hear in one of the writers and he says, but you, what is he doing? He's changing the gear. He's saying, I've been describing all these folks, but for you, remember how Paul does that with Timothy a lot? You know, he'll say something and they go, but as for you, my young man, he's telling you, that's not the way you're going to be. Here's what he says. Verse 20, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Don't panic. Step back and start by building yourself up in the faith. If you're going to contend, defend, agonize over the faith, you got to know that faith. And you got to build yourself up in it. This thing was given by God, Jesus, and through the Holy Spirit. It's recorded by the apostles. It was given to the apostles and then has been passed down generation after generation. Here is the faith. And God says, I've entrusted it to you. You and I owe God to know what that faith is. To study it, to know it, to set our hearts on it. Now, let me give a specific challenge or two in this area if I could. I said, uh, I think it was last week, this idea that comes from our study here is that you are responsible for what goes into your ears. And I want to I want to take that challenge just a little bit further. I think it is too easy for some of us to stay pretty shallow theologically. Let that sit a second. It is too easy. This is what the Hebrew writer wrote about. By the time you ought to have been teachers, you need somebody to teach you the elementary things all over again. We keep going back to some basic, simple things of the Bible, but you don't seem to get conviction about them. And you stay in an infant stage. That's a dangerous place to be if you're going to try to contend for what God has entrusted you with. Grow up. Get into your Bible. Study it. I hope, 
Uh, you know, I know doing a series like this, three weeks in the book of Jude, over 20 some odd verses and throwing Greek words at you and, and, and going to hit you with another kind of hard thing to look at. But dig, go deep, go deep into your faith. Now, let me give one more little, and I'm jumping up on my soapbox, so I'm, I'm, I'm admitting it and telling you I am right now. But I want you to think through this. Let's go back to that phrase, you are responsible for what goes into your ears. Now go back to verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 19. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. Now I got a question for you. Surely you can quickly and easy answer this question. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Acts 2.38, right? I mean, you repent, you get baptized, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's just as simple as can be. All right? But when your dear favorite preacher says, that's not how you get the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit by praying Jesus into your heart. If you have, an ev if you have even basic convictions about clearly what the Bible teaches, you can't come but to one conclusion. Follow me on this. It's a little icky, but follow me here. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And yet some of us consistently and constantly fill our minds with the teachings of people that you know, if you follow your Bible, do not have the Holy Spirit. Why would you do that? Now, let me be balanced. I also understand the other perspective where I will read things about Buddhism or Islam or a lot of other things in the world trying to understand what they teach in order to be able to defend the gospel. We certainly have to do that. So I want to be fair here. I'm not saying you're sinning if you're out there reading something, but you got you to gotta wrestle with that. And you got to say, you know, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I keep filling my mind and allowing that to come in. Because let's be honest, is any of us that good? That we can filter out every little, or might it be, as I shared in that illustration. It's funny, I share with y'all, you know, there's certain comedians I listen to. And I find myself sometimes saying things I've heard them say. And I did it like three times this week. And I laughed at myself and I went, there it goes. I'm not intending to do it. It's just because I've heard it over and some of them I've heard the same joke 20 times, but it still makes me laugh. And so I go right back and then lo and behold, two days later, I'm talking to somebody and it's not even just the words, it's the way they say it. How do you know that's not happening when you're opening up your mind? I got a, I got a foolproof solution. There it is. There it is. Know your faith. That's the first thing that Jude tells us. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. Second thing he says, verse 21, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life so the second thing that Jude says don't get all freaked out build up your faith and keep yourself in God's love now you got to stop and think about what that means what does it mean to keep yourself in God's love and how would that apply to this situation? You know, we can say some kind of generic, well, you know, God loves me. Amen. You know, whatever. I think there's a much deeper thought. here. Here's what I believe he means. Every one of us needs love, right? 
Every single one of us needs love, needs to give love. You were created to be that way. And what Jude is saying is this, you better make sure that where your primary source of the love in your life comes from is from God and God alone. Because if that ever gets askew, if you think that you're going to get the love you need in your life from your spouse, you're setting yourself up for a big, big fall. I'm going to illustrate it this way, not to pick on our single sisters. I'll illustrate it maybe in three ways. Maybe, maybe I'll, but I'm going to throw this one out first. Here's how this works. All of us need to be loved. I think there's some amazing, young, beautiful sisters that I scratch my head sometimes and go, what in the world is wrong with these young men? Some I need to whop them upside the head. What are they thinking? All right. There's some sitting in this room right now. I go, how in the world has some guy, whether it be here or across the Southeast or somewhere in the kingdom of God and praise God for things that can, can connect disciples and all that. Amen. But I scratch my head sometimes and go, what is wrong with you? I, I'm getting off here. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I got to <laughs> set the hook. Where was I? All right. There's a place I'm going. But I can tell you this. I understand the young sister who's been devoted to God for a long time. And this is why I emphasize this word right here. He says, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait. Oh, we're not good at waiting, are we? <laughs> and let's be honest. It's not just single sisters. We can get impatient in our jobs. We can get impatient with a lot of things. And we get tired of waiting. And we start seeking love someplace else. That's what he means by keep yourself in God's love. Because you're setting yourself up to fall for all kinds of things. Well, I guess I'll just go date this non-Christian. I need love in my life. I'm hurting. I don't know. I've waited. I've waited. It doesn't look like God's going to answer my prayer. And I believe that's exactly what he's saying. Oh, you've got because, and hey, it works in a church too. Because you go. Well, Triangle Church ain't perfect. So, John, you're right, it ain't perfect. Or, you know what? I'm a little tired of that over-turf guy because he, he, he showed a Billy Graham clip the other day or he talked about Smiley Preacher or whatever. That just bothers me when he... I'm gonna go to a church where everything's nice and easy and everybody likes my church. Okay, but doesn't your Bible say that in this world they hated me, they will hate you. In this world they persecuted me, they... You know what? If we're not getting some persecution, and you know if you've been around this church very long, we stand with the Bible on some issues that the world would look at us and go, you bigot, you this, you that, would call us every name in the book. And sooner or later, it can get pretty easy to go, you know what? I'll just go find me a church where I can believe anything I want to believe. Or I can, I don't have to believe that. They'll, they'll never preach about it. They'll just, you know. And it can get so easy to go look for some place and go, I'm going to go where the world loves. It works in 20 different ways in our life. You, you make the application to where you are. Here's what Jude says. You better keep God as your source of love. Oh, it will be so easy to follow one of these people that are saying, how about this? This sounds good. Why, yes, it does. That sounds good to me. Because you're not getting it from God. All right. Then he concludes 
whew, with a challenging piece of scripture. I'm going to read it first, and then I want to describe something that's happening here before we finish out with a beautiful, beautiful part of the Bible. Be merciful, verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing by uh, clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Okay, this is one of the most difficult sections of Scripture in the Bible. And I can't get real technical about it. I just don't have time, but I want to whet your appetite a little bit to go and take a look at it. Uh, these verses are contested in a lot of different ways because it, it's, th there's a lot of what we call in textual criticism variances. You know how the Bible was put together. We don't, we don't have Paul or Jude's handwritten copy of the Bible. We have manuscripts. We have pieces of the Bible, and we have them hundreds sometimes over for one scripture. And it's very easy sometimes to take all of those and just put them all together. And you go, it's very obvious. We have a very accurate record. This particular group of scriptures is not that way. Now, it shouldn't erode your confidence because we can go other places in the Bible and find exactly what we should do. But I just want you to see because there's some great disagreement about whether there are two or three categories of people that he's talking about. Okay? And there's really good reason for that. You can make a great argument in Greek out of either one of those. Not to get into all that, I would say, and one of the reasons that I land where the NIV has landed, and so as I believe the RSV, KJ, or no KJV, I believe goes the other way. They group it into two groups of people. Now, I'll give you one of my arguments for this. Just about every, remember when I slipped in a while ago, there's three things you'd said about, remember I said I'd come back to that? Go see how many times he does that in this book. Remember the three guys' names that he called out, the stories he wanted to refer you back to? Three guys. Remember the characteristics that he gives in verses 12 through 13? Three things. Remember how many stories he tells to talk about their, their uh, rejecting of authority? Three stories. He loves to work in threes. So we get to the end of this book and it appears that it's correct. Let's break those three down. It's very important because what he's going to do is tell us how to act towards these people. Number one, be merciful to those who doubt. Do you understand in all this discussion and all these things that go on in society and the church and maybe we're discussing something, there's people in the middle of all that. They're young Christians or they're weak in their faith and they go, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to think. I mean, if, if I listen to Doug Jacoby, he says this, but Steve Kennard says this, and they're both good brothers. And, and, and so we can, now I don't believe, by the way, that's the context of Jude. Because the context of Jude is what they were teaching is dead wrong. I believe good brothers can disagree on certain things. What I want you to see is there's people that are in the middle of all this. And Jude is concerned about those people. He's writing to a church and he's saying, you got you to contend for the faith, but you also have to care for that young doubting disciple. Okay, show them mercy, help them along. We don't want them walking around, you know, flirting with false teaching, caught in the crossfire, confused. Take your time and help them. Then I believe he goes to the second category. He says, snatch others from the fire and save them. You think he was serious about this? He saw it as an issue of salvation. They need to be saved. This word uh, in Greek, it is the word harpazo. It is translated, uh, at least in the NIV, let me see, snatch them. The word literally translated is take by force. Okay, so you go home this afternoon, the sun finally breaks out, amen. Um, and you look across the street and you realize your neighbor's house is on fire. 
smoke's billowing out of it. You know they're there. All their cars are there. You just saw them while ago. Do you turn to your wife and go, honey, what do you think if we moseyed over to the Frank's house, that's our neighbors across the street, and, and we just sort of checked up on them, see how they're doing today. <laughs> and we walk up to the door and we, hello, it's, it's your friendly neighbors, it's Mr. Rogers, here we are. <laughs> Anybody home? Hello. Of course not. You're going to run as fast as you can run. You're going to slam on that door so loud, so hard. You're going to scream from the top of your lungs. And if they don't answer that door quickly, you're going to knock it down, right? Or you're going to break through a window. You're going to go in and you are going to take them by force and snatch them out of that fire. And that's exactly what Jude says to that's his terminology. There are other people that they kind of see where they're headed and they're being, they're being deceived, has been talked about so much. They're following false doctrine. They're listening to things that are messing them all up and they need someone to love them enough to be aggressive with them and to go, get over here. You are going to talk to me. What are you thinking? What are you doing? Get out of there. When's the last time you did that? I don't know about you, but I've watched way too many people walk away from this church. And I'm not sure we can, as a church, say we've made those kinds of efforts for people caught up in this battle to snatch them out of the fire and save their life. The final, I believe, third category, understand this, where it says two others, those words do not appear in a lot of the manuscripts. Now, here's where some of the controversy, is he really going to a third group of people or not? I believe he is and believes it follows the text, follow what it says. To others show mercy, that word can just as easily be translated pity. But what does he say next? Mixed with fear. You start dealing with these people, you better have some fear in your heart. It's a dangerous thing you're undertaking. And he says, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. Whatever that means, whatever picture, possibly a picture from the Old Testament, the inner garment uh, being stained by the sinful man. There's some picture that Jude is drawing, but whatever it is, it clearly communicates separation. Stay away, bro. Stay away. With fear, stay away. I believe it is a third category. I believe that's the people that Jude is talking about. These people that do these things, get them out of there. You know, that fits with what Paul taught. One of the things these people do is what divides you. And what does Paul say do? Warn them once after that, have nothing to do with them. It's very consistent in scripture that he says, there's only one way to deal with the people Jude is talking about. The grumblers, the complainers, the libertines, the ones that create chaos and division and all that. He goes, don't bro with fear in your heart. Have pity, love them and pray that they, but don't go near them. He's protecting the church. That's hard. So we're taking care of the weak, those doubting. We're getting right in there with those that are being pulled away in their thinking and in their hearts. And we're loving them, but we're going to snatch them. And with those who are clearly going to teach this and do this and will not repent, don't touch them, bro. Don't touch them. That's some that's some meaty advice, isn't it? You're going to have to weigh on that. All right, let's get to the end. I love this part because I got to tell you, I have my days. And if you've ever led anybody anywhere, anytime, you should have your days too to go, my goodness, am I up to the task? And praise God for the next few verses. 
To him who is able to keep you from falling, praise God. Now, by the way, why in the world can people say you can't fall from God if it's the very thing that he praises God for being our helper to keep us from falling? It's got to be possible. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault. It's not up to me. Praise God that it's not up to me to figure it all out. You ever feel that? I guarantee you, if there's, you're a leader sitting in this church, you felt that. I want to encourage you. I want to push you back to God and say, remember, to him who is able. He will see us through this. Do the right thing. Have the right heart. I cannot know the number of times I've sat in a staff meeting or with the elders or all of us together. And the, the response in the room be, I don't know. So all we can do is pray that God will make it clear. Well, you know what? That's an okay place to be. As long as we remind ourselves, he is able. He'll work it out. It'll all come to fruition one way or the other. He'll figure it out. Then the last thing he says there, and with great joy. Now, I know the tone of the book is anti-tolerance. It's, it's strong. It's hard. But it doesn't mean God wants us to walk around the fellowship, you know, scared of one another. It's not what I'm saying. With great joy, we live out and we keep defending what God has entrusted to us. Gary Hundley prayed in our prayer this morning. And I love this. God, keep us to the end. Isn't that what we're after? What a great prayer. I don't want to come this far and to be led off into doctrinal or heart error or any way. I want to stay with God. He is able. Let's close with these questions. It's just a review. I want, don't worry, these will be posted on the internet. There's several of them. I want you to close your eyes. I don't want you to try to take notes. You can go get it later this afternoon. Let's conclude our study answering a lot of the questions that have been raised. All right? And if, are y'all singing a song here at the end? Y'all quietly make your way up, but listen while you come, right? Do open your eyes as you walk though, okay? <laughs> okay. Could you be on the edge of doctrinal or spiritual apostasy? Could you? Number two, do you resist fighting spiritual battles because they are not glamorous or enjoyable? Number three, are you drawn to cheap grace? Number four, is truth worth fighting for? Are you willing to dig to the source instead of just spraying air freshener on it? And you remember our discussion about that. Am I taking responsibility for what goes in my ears? Could Satan be using me to hurt the body of Christ? Am I a joy to the leadership in my life? Am I frequently involved in conflict? Do I grumble? Do I complain? Do I fault find? Am I snatching the weak from the fire? And do I confront those? who murmur, complain, divide, reject authority, and fault find. I think we've got 25 verses to put our hearts into and to ask ourselves, God, am I really, am I really defending what you have entrusted to 
me. God is able. God help us. Amen.